The proximal phalanx insertion, as we discussed, is active when? Well, it's active when the MP joint is hyperextended. Let's take a look. In normal active finger motion, this little slip of an insertion, which many times is, is missing anatomically, is actually inactive. There's no tension here during normal finger flexion and extension to a neutral position. In this cadaver specimen, it appears to be a very significant insertion, as in this one. You can see that we're looking down on the metacarpal phalangeal joint. You can see the probe is under the collateral ligament, and here is a significantly wide and broad insertion. When the metacarpal phalangeal joint hyperextends, there is tension on the sagittal bands that limit proximal excursion, and from a position of zero to the maximum hyperextension, the primary force for MP extension is now this insertion, if present at all. I would offer that many individuals who cannot hyperextend perhaps do not have this insertion. And I would also say that this, in, the ability to hyperextend is not limited by this insertion, but rather by the proximal movement limited by the sagittal bands. Now we've talked about the central slip and the central slip insertion. And as we said, if this hand pulled on the extensor digitorum communis and it were primary at the central slip insertion, tension here would indeed extend the PIP joint. But it first has to extend the MP joint and so there's not always enough left. Take a look again at this same image. We talked about the central tension which falls away and then the lateral tension which is more dominant in full finger extension. So the central slip insertion alone is not carrying the tension to extend the PIP joint. We talked about variable anatomy and here instead of seeing one central slip and very clearly defined conjoined lateral bands, what we see instead in this specimen is it looks as if there are multiple tendons sort of fanning out and going in multiple directions. But there still is a central slip that carries tension down to the PIP joint and there would be an insertion that's distal to the PIP joint. So the extensor digitorum communis is not extending the PIP joint via the central slip alone, but the tension on the central slip from the EDC is pulling proximally on the entire dorsal apparatus, and along with that proximal movement is tension on the central slip ins insertion. They are not separate, they work conjointly. Here is a lateral view of the PIP joint. We see the proximal phalanx, the articulation, the middle phalanx, a very clear long volar plate with the swan tail, a pulley for the flexor tendon, and most of all we see the central slip and the central slip insertion just distal to the PIP joint. The mechanical advantage of this insertion so close to the axis of the joint is not very great. So indeed the central slip insertion alone does not have a lot of power for PIP joint extension. So what muscles do extend the PIP joint through the central slip insertion? Is it just the EDC? I would say that it is indeed a combination of all of the muscles that extend the finger. The EDC, the lumbrical, and the interosseous. The terminal tendon insertion we've already looked at. Here is a schematic drawing of the extensor digitorum communis and the sagittal bands. We often think that tension from the extensor digitorum communis is a primary force that extends a finger. But we must keep in mind that those lateral bands, we talked about how the lateral bands carry tension. Here we've drawn it only on one side, but it's that tension that goes to the terminal tendon insertion 
and there's a contribution from the extensor digitorum communist. It's not the extensor digitorum communist, but it's a contribution to the terminal tendon insertion. That's how the power is gathered distally. We spoke about mechanical efficiency of insertions, and the terminal tendon insertion, very similar to the central slip insertion, occurs just across the joint as it inserts into bone. Again, not being a very mechanically strong, it, the mechanical effect is not very strong. Therefore, even though the entire power of the dorsal apparatus ends in the terminal tendon insertion, that does not mean that this is a very powerful uh, point of insertion. We do have the EDC contribution, but the power distal to the MP joint, remember, is somewhat diminished because it's secondary. All the primary power is going to extend the MP joint. The lateral bands provide a much more direct power to the terminal tendon insertion. But, as you may recall, the lumbrical and the interossea are the muscles that are providing the distinct power into the lateral bands. There's no direct power from the EDC into the lateral bands. So the terminal tendon insertion receives both the power of the lateral bands as well as power, secondary power, from the EDC via the conjoined lateral bands. Here we see the terminal tendon insertion, lateral view of the DIP joint, again with a significant volar plate, the insertion of this very mechanically powerful flexor digitorum profundus, and a rather weak, or I should say weaker, dorsal apparatus power that is inserting into the dorsal aspect of the distal phalanx. Look how much larger this tendon is and how much larger the area of insertion as compared to the dorsal apparatus at that point. So the primary insertion of the extensor digitorum communis is the sagittal band and all points distal to that, in my opinion, are secondary insertions. And we cannot say that they are only the insertion of the EDC. They are dorsal apparatus insertions and not just EDC. Mm -hmm.